No. Eh, eh, eh. Today is going to be another kind of quicker, shorter sort of video and the theme is the conflict in the Middle East. So the first novel I would like to mention is Elias Houri's Gate of the Sun, which was published in 1998. This novel sort of centers around two protagonists, uh, Yunus, a Palestinian freedom fighter who is currently in a coma, and his, let's say, quasi-spiritual son, Khalil, who is tending to him and who is trying to, like, get him well again and who has difficulties admitting the fact that perhaps he or Yunus will never, you know, um, get better again. So it's really a novel that sort of, like, talks about uh, Palestinians in exile, the whole experience of the Palestinians after 1948, after the Nakba, and a lot of the story is actually set in the Shatila refugee camp in Lebanon, because after 1948, tons of Palestinians basically poured into the country of Lebanon, where they sought refuge. So the way Elias Houri kind of like assembled his story is by collecting over several years uh, stories from the refugee camps, and he really kind of gives us this... Uh, incredible overview of the Palestinian experience. And the reason why the novel is called Gate of the Sun is because at Babal Shams, which is, you know, translated called Gate of the Sun, that's where Yunus usually over the years would meet his uh, beloved wife. If you remember in Solferino 1914 continued, I talked about the Harki, the Algerians who had to flee to France, and in the 1960s they were kind of put into these transit camps, and at that moment when I was talking about the novel of uh, Ali Zeniter, I told you that, you know, it was really horrifying to read that a lot of these supposed transit camps um, only got closed down in the 1980s. Well, with Patilla, it's a completely different story. So these are refugee camps that have been basically set up at the end of the 40s and they are still here today and so still housing not just one generation of Palestinian refugees, but now already many more. And especially because of the Syrian war of the past years, there's now also kind of this new wave of Syrian refugees that are now also in the Sabra and Shatila refugee camps. And talking about Sabra and Shatila, this now kind of like leads us to the other title I want to talk about today, which actually is not a book, but an animated documentary film, and it's called Waltz with Bashir. This one actually really just focuses on the Sabra and Shatila massacre, which happened during the Lebanon War of 1982, when lots and lots of Palestinian refugees were basically massacred by the Lebanese Christian Falange. Foreman in the film is trying to discover or uncover why he's suffering from amnesia and what exactly happened in 1982 when he was doing his military service as part of the Israeli Defense Forces. Because he, at the moment when the massacre happened, was actually there and through the process of uh, talking with different people who were there at the time, he slowly uncovers and peels away the layers of his so-called non-existent memory to, to come to the supposed truth. It's a very striking film, uh, also not an easy watch, and I'm not gonna give away the ending, but uh, yeah, I would, I would still definitely recommend it. Now, since we've been talking about a novel, but also an animated film, I also want to point you to Guy Delisle's Chronique de Jérusalem. So, Guy Delisle is a Canadian animator and cartoonist, and he's known for his graphic novels where he talks about different cities or countries. So he did, for example, a graphic novel on his time in Shenzhen in the Chinese city, also one on Pyongyang, and also one on Burma slash Myanmar. And the latest, or I think it's the latest, in the series is sort of the graphic novel on Jerusalem. Now, the thing that always kind of like doesn't rub me the wrong way with his graphic novels, but um, I think it's kind of like, a, a trick or 
a thing he sort of uses in his graphic novels is that at the beginning of all of these graphic novels he sounds very naive he doesn't know how things you know are done or how things work uh, which lends him kind of like this kind of like hapless uh, foreigner I guess uh, patina but uh, I think he really uses it in a way to show that you know he doesn't have any preconceived notions uh, or any judgments already made, so he's kind of like open-minded coming to a new place and then he kind of just observes what's happening and from then on he takes decisions on what he will think about the situation he finds himself in. And um, I have to say I really enjoyed all of his graphic novels, like Shenzhen and also Pyongyang, but I really think that in Jerusalem his storytelling craft really kind of like reached, I, I don't know, a sort of acme, like the way he kind of structures it. Uh, at the end, when you're on the last page, it really hits you. Like he, it's just, there's a rhythm to it. There's a kind of like, um, yeah, just way of the way the story is interwoven that kind of really makes it work especially well. And so, again, not an easy read. At the end, you will be... <laughs> probably left more hopeless than anything else but uh but i would still definitely also recommend this one and now i know this hasn't been the happiest of videos so i will try to find a little bit of comic relief all well although it might be more kafkaesque than anything else so there is a connection with uh Elias Suleiman, who is a Palestinian film director, and Elias Houri, because there is a late French producer who was very pivotal in kind of like pushing um, cinema from that region, and I think he was pivotal in getting the adaptation of Elias Houri's novel made, but he was also very pivotal in kind of like pushing Elias Suleiman's films. And uh, I think the latest of Ilya Suleiman is called It Must Be Heaven. And it's it's a very quirky, slow-paced piece of cinema. There's also one scene that really made me eye roll when he's just in Paris, kind of like staring for three, five minutes at beautiful women walking up and down. And I was just like, oh my God, I'm almost gonna like just force fast forward. But I mean, never mind. But there's really some just scenes of, butcher like Kafkaesqueness that uh, just heighten or underscore just uh, uh, I don't know just it's the ridiculousness of everything uh, or the absurdity of the situation um, so yeah so that would be one and then there's also uh, and that I don't think it's a good movie or I don't know it's called Tel Aviv is oh, no Tel Aviv on fire and it's just, I mean, the premise is that we have a Palestinian who works for, I don't know, a soap opera thingy. And then he gets an Israeli soldier uh, to help him with, like, the... <laughs> like, the... Like, like gets him to help him write the storyline. And it's just... I mean, again, also kind of like some uh, quite intense... Um, I would say, uh, criticism in a, again, very, like, absurd way. Uh, but yeah, this one, I'm not sure. It's definitely not as polished looking as uh, Suleiman's film, but I don't know. I think it was on television recently, so I was like, okay, interesting. And in a weird twist, it also then connects back to the wars in Lebanon, because the main actress, or one of the main actresses, also appears in Incendie and Incendie? Incendie? How they pronounced it? I don't know. My French is not that good. But arrête ça! And as for musical accompaniment, well, there is uh, the Lebanese singer Yasmin Hamdan, who is actually married to Elia Suleiman, and she also appeared in Jim Jarmusch's Only Lovers Left Alive. And I guess that kind of like somehow brings us back to Elias Houri as well, because one of the main themes of Gate of the Sun is, of course, the, the love between Yunus and his uh, beloved wife. So, yeah. I think that's it. Boo-boo-boo-boo-boo-doom-ba. boo 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 boo
Zoom. <laughs>